There it is. All right, we are recording. We are live. Welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to this webinar here today, hosted by Travify Academy with three amazing panelists who I will introduce in just a couple minutes. Um, but to quickly introduce myself first, before I get too uh, far along here, is I'm Stephanie Grice, and I'm the Senior Client Champion Education Coordinator here at Travify. And I just want to thank you again for joining us here today. Um, we really wanted to host this webinar to help inspire these new ideas for sales, marketing, um, business, a range of topics um, with our panel experts. And even though we're still working through the pandemic, we're so hopeful that Travel's Big Comeback is making its way soon. And we want to help you get ready for that. And I know for a lot of you, it's already happening. It, you are experiencing booking, booking, bookings, which is super amazing. Um, a, things are just already, it's happening. We know it's there. Um, so, you know, whether you're managing or hosting group trips, this is a great niche to get into to increase those commissions if done right. So that's why we're here today. We want, this is always a hot topic and we'll also talk about, I'm sure, you know, just, um, you know, regular trip planning as well. But um, we really want to focus on groups business because we hear a lot of agents that want to get into certain niches. And this is one of those hot topic niches. Um, so that's why we want to chat with um, our panelists today who have all just made this very successful in their business. Um, but before I dive into the conversation, I do want to um, quickly explain Travify Academy and what we do if this is your first time joining us. So if it's your first time joining us, hello, we're excited for you to be here. Um, we have so much fun with Travify Academy and what we are here to do is to be a free educational resource to further Travify's mission to power the success of travel professionals. So you can find webinar replays, articles, tons of helpful content on academy.travify.com. We even have a podcast, Erica Graham, who's joining us has been on the podcast recently. So check all of that out. Um, it's super, super great stuff. Um, but also be sure to like, our Facebook page um, to get all the up-to-date information on upcoming webinars and podcasts too. Um, and then a couple of things I want to mention too, is this is being recorded. I have specifically made sure of that it is recorded. Um, so you'll find this recording uh, later on today on our YouTube channel, um, but also at academy.travify.com. So if you need to hop off, you want to send it to a colleague or a friend, feel free to do that. You'll find it up there. Um, the other thing I want to mention is hopefully we have time for a QA. and a um, We've slotted it in, um, but if we do have time, please ask your questions in that question area. We have Scott Rutz from our team, um, from the Travify team in the back end, helping to answer those questions and feeding them to us as well. So um, please use that area um, and hopefully we can get those questions answered. But now, the moment we've waited for to introduce <laughs> our panelists joining us here today. Um, so I'm just going to introduce each one here. So we have Lisa Fitzgerald, who is founder of Fitzgerald Travel. And then we also have Erica Graham, who is owner and operator of Paper Planes and Passports. Hey. And then we have Lorraine Simpson, who is CityLine TV travel expert, speaker, and also owner of the Travel Cafe. So welcome, everybody. This is an amazing panel. I'm really excited for this today. It's going to be fun. It'll be a really good time. And one thing I want to mention too, before we get on the questions is how this is going to be structured. So how we're going to do this is we're going to split it into three parts. We are going to split it into marketing, sales, and business. So it encompasses all of the success, you know, for your business, but we tried to organize it a little bit here. So the first thing we're going to focus on is marketing. Um, so I'm going to begin asking questions to the panelists, but again, panelists feel free to chime in at any point at all. Um, so we'll just keep this chill, relaxed conversation. So grab, you know, some tea, coffee, water, as I was showing Red Bull, Lorraine's getting some coffee here <laughs> uh, delivered to her. So make it fun and we will all hang out. Um, but to dive right in here. So for marketing, so marketing is a huge factor, of course, to many agents success when selling group travel. So I really want to hear, um, you know, what you all have found so helpful, but also that helps navigate marketing during the pandemic. So Lorraine, I'm going to start with you here, um, because you are located in Canada and I know we have a can lot of Canadian advisors on this panel and it's looking a little different for you compared to us agents and others around the world too. Um, so how do you handle marketing during a time like this? And what does the, the last year look like and right now? 
<laughs> well, right now we are 100% jealous of our friendly neighbors in the South. Um, we're looking at you with envy as we see everything opening up and all the bookings that you guys are making and our friends are making. So we are envious. And it is very difficult in Canada to promote because actually there's a lot of um, uh, hatred for when you start to market travel, people think you're doing a terrible thing. So there's a lot of shaming going on, um, particularly me working in TV. I'm not even allowed to mention anything to do with travel. So we have to be a bit more creative. And no matter where you are, I think creativity also sets you apart from other people. Um, now for me, for example, somebody actually said to me about six months ago, there's no such thing as takeout for travel. And I thought, hmm. I wonder if I could fix that because at the moment takeouts are allowed here in Canada but that's pretty much it so I opened a coffee shop now that's a bit drastic and I'm not suggesting that anybody on the um, call today should open their own coffee shop but I basically turned my uh, office into a partially a, an espresso bar and bought an espresso machine and and did that now as far as marketing goes though we just have to be ready and willing with all the new information and be present because people will come to you whether you're in canada whether you're in the states wherever you are in the world we're all equally flattened we're all equally startups right now so the very big guys that we used to look at and say oh they're worth millions of dollars no we're all in the same boat we're all flattened we've all got nothing so now how you stand up and how you become and remain visible in a very positive way, in a knowledgeable way, that is marketing now. That's a different way of marketing, but it is marketing yourself. It's marketing your knowledge. It's marketing your attitude and your willingness to give people information. And then they will naturally come to you. So you really are looking for that attraction, that law of attraction type of thing, rather than actually going out saying, hey, what about a cruise? You know, we jokingly here say, when we sell an, uh, an espresso, we'll say, would you like a trip with that? You know, but it's a joke. But if somebody says yes, you know, you wouldn't believe how many people come in, buy an espresso and say, so um, is Africa open at the moment? Uh, can we go to Turkey? Oh, come into my office, sit down on my couch and I'll talk to you. So it's, it's guerrilla marketing at its best. That is really cool. Yeah, I, I love that. That's Amazing. So really, really cool. And um, Lisa, I want to go to you next too here because I know that you market river cruises for groups and you have been marketing and um, how has that looked like for the past year and, and to right now? And what have you found are the best marketing tools for you to get the word out there? Well, um, COVID, like for all of us, kind of threw us in a loop. We didn't know exactly what to do. We didn't know how to handle it, though. Um, we decided the best way during the past 15 months was just to stay on the um, tone of inspiration. And so we've been marketing the idea of travel um, over two different sources. And one has been to do our weekly newsletter every week filled with not like so much trips that we're putting together for groups, but just for travel inspiration, talking about um, COVID and just reaching out to everybody who wants to listen somewhat like Lorraine um, is doing. However, I love the idea of the couch and a coffee. Um, so we've done our marketing differently, just staying in that inspiration mindset. And then um, we always focused on forward and we always planned, um, what are we going to do in 2022? What are we going to do in 2023? So my marketing has um, also involved a lot of Facebook ads to bring me some raw cold leads so that I could get these people on our list and continue to inspire, inspire them um, until the time was ready, you know, until it's ready to go time. Um, and we do a lot of that with building out, um, taking some samples of some cruise itineraries for 2022 and 2023, building them out and Travify, making them look absolutely amazing, enticing them, and then embedding that into our newsletter. That's been the best way so far. Yeah, to just kind of show them visually what this inspiring, you know, 
showing what's ahead. So yeah, that's really cool. And Erica too. So Erica just got back from a, a group trip too. So what have you found um, were ways that you found those travelers and what are the best marketing tools that you like to use to um, plan those trips? Or so pretty much for the last 15 months, they had COVID got us all a little bit. But for me, I took the route of telling people what is opening, what are the restrictions, how soon you can get in, what are your requirements to get in. Um, I actually released several group trips during COVID to plan for 2021 because I knew that my customers and my clients were going to be ready to travel even. My travelers started back in May. So as soon as some countries, the Caribbean countries started opening, I was ready and I was getting them safely on flights and uh, with testing and everything. So um, with this last group trip, we just hosted in Morocco, uh, Africa, we, um, I released it in 2020 and I used social media. Um, I took polls. I, I used pretty much Facebook and Instagram and just a direct network of email marketing from um, repeat customers that I had and that I was communicating with during the pandemic as they were calling me, checking on me, and I was checking on them as well. Um, so I literally just kept using um, the same tools that I had pretty much, which were email, social media, and just keeping everyone abreast of what were the opening and the requirements and restrictions to enter. So that that's how I was successful in um, actually starting to host group trips even uh, as early as 2021. Yeah, that's really cool. And, and again, with the inspiration, you know, that's just been such a, the driver, people see it and know this is what you can do. And here's the trip. So really awesome and exciting that you just got back too. That's really cool. <laughs> like and a couple of days ago. So <laughs> We're all so jealous. It sounds amazing. Well, you know, you have to travel to keep people inspired. They have to see you traveling. They have to see that you have, you know, you're, I don't know if the word brave, but you got to get out there. You have to show them and continue to inspire them that um, travel is still available to most of us, Lorraine. I'm sorry. Yes, um, Lorraine, we, we, but, we apologize, but that's exactly what I did. Um, I traveled. I did road trips throughout the pandemic. I also did some um domestic and short international flights. Morocco is the farthest that I've been so far, but I've been to Mexico, Costa Rica, and now Morocco and some state, several states uh, throughout the pandemic. So I myself learned how to travel during the pandemic and was able to tell my clients how to do it successfully and more importantly, safely um, so that they could do it the same. I think that is important is, is to keep the dream of travel alive, definitely. I think people mm -hmm. need to see that. They need to understand what it's going to look like and how they're going to feel when they travel because people don't know. So I remember many years ago, I lived in England and uh, Canada was having a problem with SARS, the, the, the um, flu, bird flu at the time. I think it was 2001 or something. And the, the bad publicity in England was basically if you were to arrive in Canada, you would probably drop dead the minute you, you exited the plane. You know, and, and that is the same way with this is people have this idea that, oh, my gosh, if I go outside my door, I'm going to die. Um, so it's up to us as agents to really keep that dream of travel alive and to uh, to inform. And I think what you said, Eric, is brilliant. You know, you, you've just got to keep them posted of all the new protocols and what's open, what's available, what it looks like, what it feels like, how people can enjoy it. You know, that that's I think it's so important to do that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's the key awesome. is sharing the experience. The more you share, the more people can see, the more comfortable they will become over time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Walk the walk, talk the talk. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly that. And so what about, okay, so post pandemic world or even like before the pandemic for um, agents who are just starting out with selling groups, what tips would you give them? Um, so Lorraine, I'll start with you again. So what are some tips for agents that are just starting to sell travel and, and, and COVID could still play a factor because you can't really avoid that, but are there any other tips to outside of that, that they should do to grow that business? 
Yeah, so uh, what they can do is uh, find out a, a place that they think is going to open up first. Um, places that people uh, feel comfortable traveling to, places that have done incredibly well out of the, the pandemic. And then look at how early you think you can get away with selling something. So for example, you might, if you're in Canada, you might look at doing a river cruise um, in the Christmas markets time. Um, selling anything too soon you're going to get a lot of kickback. You can sell. If somebody comes in and says, hey, I want to go on a cruise, absolutely fine. But for actual marketing purposes, um, if you look at sort of the fall time, then we can start to consider that, um, you know, and, and, and look at being able to incentivize them and make people feel more comfortable and maybe even host it yourself. So if you actually are looking at hosting it yourself, you can say to people, listen, I'm, I'm going to go with you. I feel comfortable going. So I'm going to take you. I'm going to help you along the way. I'm going to help you at the airports. I'm going to help you manage the, um, the protocols and that sort of thing. Um, and, and that way people will start to look at, you know, what, what they're looking for. And, and maybe another thing you could do as well is put out a poll to your clients. What do they want? What would they feel comfortable? You know, it's, it's all engagement, get the engagement, get people talking, get them to give you their opinions. And then from there, you can answer that and, and go back to them. Because if we just, I, I often find that a lot of people just throw things at people, you know, book this, book this, book this, book this. But actually, whenever you walk down a street, um, if somebody was to stand in a street and they've done lots of the, uh, the, 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 um, uh, tests of this. If you stand in a street and you have a $5 bill in your hand and you say, excuse me, would you like this $5 bill? 80% um, of people will say no. So what you've got to really do is to find out what they want, be the realtor of travel. So go out there, find what they're looking for, what they feel comfortable with, what, you know, if you were a realtor, you wouldn't say, which house number do you want to buy? You would say, what does this look like? How does it feel? What is the school district you want to be in? What is the house style and all of that? And it's up to you to get that information from the potential clients and say, okay, when you do feel comfortable, what do you think will be your first trip? What do you think you would like to do? Where would you like to go? And what information would you like from me? And go from there. Open the conversation. Perfect. Yeah. And, um, and Lisa, I know, uh, pr chatting previously with you on this too. Um, I know that you approach it with, uh, so you do uh, with cold selling to a group versus warm selling. Warm to selling. A group. Yeah. So, yeah. So like, um, so I specialize, I'm hyper-focused on river cruising. So I do river cruise groups and previously I would be pre COVID, I would go out, I would meet people, I'd go to restaurants, no matter what, if the food was great and I was at a restaurant, I'd ask to speak to a chef. Like I, I would compliment them, tell them, you know, how wonderful the dinner was or the experience was, and then say, Hey, what do you think about? So that would be like a warm cell to find a Pied Piper. I would go out purposely, find someone who has a very dynamic personality, and I would approach them about creating groups. During COVID, um, I had to pivot like all of us, and I had to think about the ways to attract clientele to me, and I created this warm cell, this travel with me, come with me. Um, I put it out there as a safety net, like Oh, the whole trajectory of the way you plan travel, the way you travel is going to look totally different. So let me give you this sense of security. Let me let me take you with me and I will watch over you the whole entire time. Um, so it's like a warm and a cold. And when I say like hosting, I say it's cold because I don't have to approach anybody to become a Pied Piper. The, the attraction is me. Well, not that I'm you know, the best thing since sliced bread, but I am the security blanket. And um, it has really worked out quite well for me because people right now are feeling more comforted going with someone who has experience or has got the knowledge, like Erica, you go out and you, you educate the population about what's going on, what's opening, what we need, what are the rules, what are the restrictions. And for me, doing the host um, hosting opportunity um, helps all the people who want to travel with the why. So um, 
it's really worked out quite well, quite well. Yeah. That's awesome. I don't know, Eric, I don't want to move on uh, for Erica. Did you have anything else to add to that of um, just, you know, the uh, getting into the, like, you know, for new agents getting in any tips, things that really helped you um, when you were first starting out? Um, I, for me, I was already an experienced traveler. So a lot of people came to me naturally. It was organic for me because they saw me traveling actively. Um, I would always get a lot of questions. So it was very organic. And um, I, cre- I created that opening, that door opening for people to walk through and say, you know what? I need your help. I know that you're good at this. So help me do this. Um, and then constantly sharing those resources, even in the beginning, telling, ex, ex, explaining um, the, the different places that you can visit, um, explain, explaining the types of the, the different travel times. A lot of people don't travel because they feel like the flights are so far, you know, the distance, um, kind of breaking down some of the barriers before they can even ask those questions. Um, and that's what social media is good for. Um, we, we can definitely utilize that to our advantage. And that was kind of how I was able to, to get more travelers uh, to come along and join our hosted group trips, but then also plan their own trips. Yeah, that's awesome. So, Stephanie, I have another thing to add to that too. So, mm-hmm. you know, if you're our approaching uh, group leaders and Pied Pipers, one of the best pieces of advice I could tell anybody who may be starting out is to do the research first because you want to um, you want to approach a possible uh, group leader but by doing research, uh, especially on Facebook, finding out where they're hanging out, if it's a business, how many followers do they have. I sign up for more newsletters than you guys can possibly imagine because I like to monitor that. How often are they sending a newsletter? What kind of information are they putting out? What does their website look like? So, I mean, I have markers. If I have a client I want to go after or talk to, I look at all these markers first because I don't want to waste my time. I don't want to waste somebody else's time. And I want to work smarter and not harder. So gathering the most information up front before you make that um, first contact, either via a phone call asking for appointment writing letters um, to like winery owners or um, Italian chef here of a very successful group in Keene, New Hampshire. Um, The more research you do and the more studying of that person that you do, like what's their background? When did they start their business? Like the more you know them personally, the better the meeting goes. I just wanted to point that out because it's so important. Yeah. No, that's perfect. And that's one thing too, that I want to touch on too, is um, just, you know, if you're getting new and you just want to like test out the waters, you know, what should you be doing? And it's research, gathering those people who might be, um, you know, interested in traveling, whether they're coming to you, like how, cause Eric, I've heard the same thing too, with a lot of other agents too, where they just, they started getting people coming to them just because they were a big traveler and they're like, wait a minute, you know, I can plan these trips for all of us. Um, so really, really awesome. And, um, and, and so is there anything else that, um, any of you want to add to that of how, um, to how any tips for people starting out, but also just if someone wants to like test the waters out and see if that's, if group travel is good for them. Try to, I would say, gather some friends, see, you know, some friends and some family, see if, if they can join, do an inexpensive trip, maybe domestic, see how it goes, see how you can plan, like test the waters a little bit as your friends and family, um, just to see what you learn from the experience. If this is something you really want to do before you put your all into it and then start going after random people or possibly (laughs) random people, and then maybe provide them with a bad experience. So you want to kind of test the waters out as much as you can uh, before going full blown into it. Um, and then, yeah, I put a survey out there, see who's interested to where they want to go, figure out um, how many people you may get uh, for a trip. Uh, what I do is I kind of put my group trips out there um, almost a year in advance um, and just put surveys out there, put um, ads out there, see, get, drive traffic to the website, to my social media sites and see who's actually interested. And then I can do the numbers properly. Um, I can follow up with those people and then get a more solid number. That helps with planning um, 
budgeting, all of those things, which is super important for group trips because you can have a good budget at start with a good budget at first. And then once you start adding the things in, or you may forget about something significant, transportation, included meals, different things like that, that you just may forget about and could totally blow your budget if you've got a, a group of you know, a large group that could significantly do some damage to your budget. So (laughs) keeping all of those things in mind um, when planning those, I would say is is very helpful. Oh, and one other thing, if you can work with a group, a a team on the ground, like a a tour company, one company that would help you with transportation, maybe it's a company that can help you with tours. Sometimes you can get prices cheaper um, for you to be able to then offer your guests a cheaper price to be able to travel on that group trip. So, yeah. Awesome. And you, you touched on this and this is a question I was going to ask too, is, um, what, when you are booking, how far out do you typically start marketing group trips and what does your marketing schedule look like for that? So Erica, you said about a year out is when you start marketing. Is that pretty much kind of the similar for across the board for all of you? Yes, for me. Um, Kind of. Yeah. It depends on the location for me. I would say um, the destination, the cost of the trip, obviously the more the cost, the more time you want to give people the opportunity to make payments. Um, With me, I offer payment options for flights as well as um, hotels or private residences and tours. So for us, um, you know, the, the, the longer you give people, the more time they have to pay, the easier they can budget, which means the more people you can end up getting on your trip. Yeah, that's actually very good um, segue to like who you work with, what type mm-hmm. of suppliers are you working with, who works with you the best. My typical is 18 months in advance because it takes a lot of organization up front to be ready and to come up with your own marketing plan and design how you want it to be presented or approached. But um, well, mine started 15 months ago. <laughs> So 18 months is a good number. Oh my gosh, Lorraine. That looks so good. It does. I want one. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's I'm coming right to your in coffee shop. Yeah. In my coffee shop. Homemade sandwiches, homemade cakes. I'll, I'll oh. walk you around afterwards. When we get close to the end, I'll walk you around. Okay. Yeah. This is salted caramel mocha. Amazing. Oh my gosh. Stop it right Mouth watering. That's good. <laughs> good. Yes. Yes. <laughs> jelly very jealous yes and um and for those of you who might have missed um because i think we might have been talking about this before we started the webinar but Lor- Lor- well you mentioned that you opened your coffee shop but yes that looks so so when canada when we are allowed to come there i might just come straight to your place just come that looks good we've, yeah we've done it <laughs> like it's all about it's, it's all marketing right i'm gonna walk around it's all marketing because you know, and, and I'm not saying everybody should do this, but there are ways that you can market to make yourself stand out and talk about what you do and how you do it. So you see behind me, there's Japan. And then behind me now, that's Paris. So people can come in and sit in a corner of Paris and then they can come and they can sit in England. So we've got a little area of England with a little fireplace here. And it's, it's all about, you know, making ways that people will talk. So if you talk to wineries or, you know, um, just do something that will create a conversation, whatever it is, send somebody um, a dessert that you've made, a friend that you've got, send them a dessert that you've made that's from Vienna. And then they go, oh, this is fantastic. I loved it. Yes, well, if you go on a river cruise to Vienna, you'll be able to go in a cafe and you'll be able to taste this. Or send them, contact one of your travel suppliers and say, hey, can you send me some coffee from Peru? And I wanna send this to my clients, my best clients. And I want to get them talking. I wanna get the conversation started. So just a way of being able to get the conversation to where you want it to be. If you're sitting next to a person. So I've got two business cards, okay? Every single day, this is before pandemic. Every single day I would have two business cards and I would always have that in my pocket. And I would not allow myself to go home unless I've given away two business cards a day. Because that every, wherever you are, sitting next to somebody at the dentist, sitting next to somebody in a, um, anywhere, 
there is always a way that you can say, hey, how are you? Oh, isn't it lovely weather? Oh, it's, I heard it's nicer in England or I heard it's nicer. I bet it's nice in South Africa at the moment. Whatever it is, turn every conversation somehow into a travel themed conversation. And you may not get to actually sell to them, but you've opened the dialogue and it's the dialogue that's going to get you to be able to, to talk about travel and uh, in the future. And that's really what we need is we need to get that dialogue started, especially in Canada. Yeah, that's all. Well, first of all, thank you for the tour of the cafe. That is amazing. Really cool. But I love that. I think that encompasses everything we've been talking about with marketing is just, you know, the, um, how you're building this and how you're bringing those people to you and those travelers to you. So, which brings me into the next topic here. This is a good segue because I want to talk about sales, you know, marketing. Well, I don't know about for all of you, but for me, the marketing is like the fun part and sales is like the, the, we are, it's salespeople at the end of the day, you know, travel advisors. So this is a burning question. I'm really excited to hear um, each of your thoughts on this is what would you say when you're selling group travel, what types of of group trips do you find are the easiest to manage or generate the best revenue? And this would be factoring like efficiency, profitability. Um, So um, Erica, I'll start with you here. What would you say, is there a type of group travel that you have found is your favorite basically? (laughs) Uh, Yeah, probably destination weddings um are probably my favorite vow renewals anniversaries uh, or large birthdays um especially destination weddings because you can literally get everybody booked and then hand them off to the wedding planner so that's something that you don't really have to do it's really managing the bookings and the the people that are going to attend after that after once everyone's booked then it's really not much for that you have to do other than at this point, I mean, I add for me a a few more services as far as assisting with uh, departure COVID testing um, and then re-entry COVID testing if they aren't staying on a resort that offers COVID testing to enter back into the United States. Um, So I've added some of those services. So with that, um, those are easy. Usually um, I can get anywhere from 20 to even 100 travelers uh, for weddings or large birthday gatherings. Um, and actually in 24 days, I'm hosting 30 people in Colombia <laughs> for a birthday um, party. So yeah, like those are pretty, those are the easiest for me. Destination weddings probably are my number one. Awesome. Cool. And Lisa, what about for you? Well, since I only really um, develop um, FIT and river cruise vacations, like 95% of my business is river cruising. And I chose river cruising because you're working with a lot of like-minded people who are easy to corral because with river cruising, you know, you're sailing through the countries and a lot of people who sign up have all the same interests. So it's easy for them, you know, like it's part of the marketing thing. Oh, you're you'll be with, uh, you know, 138 other like-minded people. And of course, using a preferred supplier. I love river cruising because I love to get my commission checks with a comma. And that's very nice. And, you know, when you are doing just a particular thing like river cruising, you become an expert in one area. So, and you you travel a lot. So you have the experience under your belt and it's much more easier, much more easy. It's much easier to um, be very passionate about what you're doing. And then no matter who I meet, you know, like I said, if it was a restaurant or a winery or just, you know, a knitting club, I've actually had a knitting club. A knitting club went on a river cruise. It was great. Um, If, uh, you know, you're introducing the conversation, it's like, well, what do you think about um, going on a river cruise and bringing this and upping your level? Uh, You know, how do you feel about X, Y, and Z, this is what I can do. And bringing out the why is so important when you're trying to recruit groups and sales. So I stick with the same same, um, type of uh, travel vacations. Uh, It's easier because they're all, like I said, like-minded, the age demographics all in the same area. I know where they hang out and finding that information out um, was really um, pivotal for me. So for me, that's how I do it. And I'm very, obviously very passionate about it. So that's awesome. I forgot where I was going with that, but okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
It's passion. That is what drives yeah. everything. So it's perfect. And Lorraine, how about for you? What is it your perfect ideal group travel bookings? Well, it's always got to be like-minded people, but uh, I've always enjoyed doing the wineries or the food tours because I've I've been in that industry as well all my life. So to have um, foodies, you know, I always be I'm able to find off the beaten path places and and take them to find really unique holes in the walls and and that sort of thing. And if you work with a chef or you work with a winery. You know, you can always um, talk to them and discuss what they would be interested in. And then that way, the people that are joining you, like, for example, you might have a winery that um, does a wine specifically in the Apasmiento way. So therefore, it will be great to go somewhere like Italy. But at the same time, you don't really want to get them um, really competing almost so you sort of want to do a complete opposite or something and that's how you market it you know you just come out with different ways of being able to use their knowledge and and let them be the host let them be the the draw don't try to be the draw don't try to be the you know the number one person let them be that the, the star of the show and because you also are tr also trying to get them to sell it on your behalf as well. So you want to give them that, that power of, oh my gosh, we're so grateful. But a little word of caution here. Um, I do a lot of river cruises too. And word of caution, I did have one group where I, um, the, the, the leader, the tour leader, his son passed away during the time that we were working on a particular um, uh, culinary tour. And so of course we were not able to market as much as we would normally do. So be very careful who you work with. I worked with Armour Waterways. They were fantastic with me. They took back some of my charter rooms that I had. <laughs> Love them, Lisa, absolutely. They were very understanding. Um, otherwise, I could have lost my house. I mean, it was a partial charter and I'm not even kidding. I could have lost my house. It was a very expensive, um, it could have been a very expensive gamble. Now you don't have to do it on a partial charter. Um, there are lots of ways that you can do it just as a group, but be very careful when you book groups to make sure that if you are expected to go, you build that in right from the get-go. Because if you don't build enough uh, based on your minimum numbers, even if you do reach your maximum numbers, never think that uh, working on a group, you're always going to reach the maximum because you may only just reach the minimum. And so make sure that if you are expected to be going with that group, that that is covered. And that is uh, something that you are going to be able to afford, even if your your minimum uh, number is going. Would you, would you agree with that, Lisa? I totally agree with that. I, sh I should have mentioned that earlier doing the built-ins, but yeah, I totally agree with you. Yeah, that's a good, good point. That's what during, um, especially during the pandemic and everything, a lot of people have been saying, you know, the suppliers, how important it is to work with those suppliers who you can trust, um, you know, on those. Cause that is, that is a good fair point on group trips that things can happen just like for any other travelers and it could take a chunk of your group trip away. And, um, so yeah, that's, also important. And, um, I actually, so we're getting so many questions that I'm going to pivot in. We are, cause we have pretty much talked about all the things in business, all the things in sales and marketing, but we have a lot of great questions. So I'm just going to go right into these questions. And the first one, and Lorraine, you started touching on this just now is about the, uh, pie or well, and Lisa, you're gotten the Pied Piper, which I have heard that now I finally understand what that means. Um, <laughs> I think like I learned something today is do you compensate them? So when you're working with, do you compensate the people who are bringing in, um, the travelers? Is this a question for me or for Lorraine? Um, well, for both of you, really. So whichever one, I guess, and even you, Erica. Uh <laughs> Lorraine, you want to go first or do you want me to answer that first? You you answer, Lisa. All right. So mine is two part because it depends on who my Pied Piper is. If I go into a restaurant or to a chef um, and I approach them and I think that there's a great opportunity for me to build my business, 
I also have to feel that it's a great opportunity for him to build the business. So in my research, when I'm looking about how many followers they have or their newsletter, I can then approach that chef and say, um, how do you feel about partnering and doing something which I call joint venture, where I work with him to grow his fan base, um, because who, who's not going to want to go to his restaurant after offering such an amazing um, experience. And then I will compensate him, though I never tell him how much. He does know that he's earning his space on the ship um, at no cost and also that he will be compensated in the end. But I don't do that every time because it takes someone really special and someone who I know can perform for me, work smarter, not harder. So sometimes I do compensate them. And that'll be my part of the answer. And I'll let Lorraine answer her, her side. Like how yes. she do so I don't always compensate um, in, in financially, but I also I do often um, take the Pied Piper and their significant other on the trip, depending on where we go. And a lot of times, you know, that we're talking quite high number trips. So we will potentially take them. And often if it's somebody that's pretty famous, then often you're expected to give them uh, business class seats and that sort of thing. So it's all going to be built in to the trip. So for example, you might want to do a very expensive trip if you're taking somebody that's very high end and have a lower numbers. But I did have a friend who booked um, somebody that was very famous here in Canada and, uh, and, and he was asking for $11,000 on top of going for free and business class flights. And I said, there is no way that you're going to be able to sustain that amount of money, you know, without losing a massive amount of money. So I think, Lisa, you made a very good point is don't promise up front, you know, try to sort of incentivize, but get them to partner with you and, and promote and, and, and then that sort of thing. But it can be any kind of group. Um, but I do love to do the river cruises the most, especially because it's, it's easy. It's so much has done for you already. And, um, and, you know, you're making these beautiful invitations, which is fairly easy to do nowadays on Canva and that sort of thing. But have evenings, have Zoom meetings, have um, promotional events and things and, and get as many people as you can involved. Um, the way that you market it, it is different for everything that you do. But, you know, if it's a restaurant, go to the restaurant, sit there and talk to the guests and have a table and a sign and a, and a pull up banner. And, you know, yes, we're going with them. And no, do you want to come with us? <laughs> You know, maybe that's not here in Canada, but, you know, whatever, we're, we're, we're working towards that. Um, I wanted to answer Megan's question here about um, the strong pushback from the Canadian clients when discussing current travel options. Yeah, it is. And it sucks. And there's nothing we can do about it. So we're going to have to just go with the flow, wait it out and um, more inspire than sell you're going to inspire more. And if they want to come to you and they want to book it, great, kiss their feet. But if they don't want to book it, then we, we cannot make them want to go. We just have to be very, um, very sort of politically correct saying, when you feel comfortable enough to travel, I will have the information ready for you and I will give you anything you need to know about travel. I will help you. I will help you book. I'll get the information you need. But when you are ready, because we cannot make them, um, you know, we cannot make them to, 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 to want to travel right now. We just have to stand there and, and wait and be ready when they're ready. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for answering that. Cause it is the reality right now of, yeah, being ready and alert of that and everything. Um, but this question's a, a little random here from uh, Gwendolyn, and this is for Erica. Um, so you had mentioned offering payment arrangements for flights as well as hotels. Are you able to do that through the suppliers that you use, or do you use an agency um, that accepts payment plans? That if so um, I partnered with a, another business here in Atlanta that offers um, payment options for flights. Um, and as well as it depends on the suppliers, various suppliers do allow payment options for flights and hotels. Um, but I separately do have a supplier that I work with personally 
that offers the payment options for flight. So you're able to make biweekly or monthly payments up to 90 days. Uh, you can sign up for a payment option up to 90 days before you travel. Um, so that allows flexibility. We also have the lowest rate. So it's cheaper than putting your putting it paying in full on your credit card. Um, so for that, I'm all about budget uh, conscious uh, about my clients being budget conscious and able to um, still travel, go on multiple trips a year. A lot of my clients give me a budget and say, hey, I have five to $10,000 to spend this year on travel and I want you to plan out. I want to go to these many places. So plan it out. And then they put their deposits down with their flights and as well as their package, we put together their hotel and activity packages and they're able to make payments on all these trips throughout the course of their year. So I can uh, gauge exactly how much people are spending uh, with the amount of travel that I have out there or clientele that I have out there. Awesome. That's perfect. And so another question um, kind of about this um, same topic too is, um, so Teresa had asked uh, when you're taking non-refundable deposits, do you factor in your commission portion per person and any fee you charge? In other words, are you collecting your profit in the non-refundable deposit? So that question's for all of you as well too. Yes. Um, yes and no. It depends on the supplier that you book with. Um, to determine if you can do that or not. Um, most of it, my group, my hosted group trips, I'm able to, to do that. Um, but I always tell my customers to get travel insurance, purchase travel insurance, <laughs> um, because sometimes depending on when they cancel, depending on uh, what our policy is or the policy with our suppliers are, uh, will determine if I can get a refund or not. So, um, and based off of obviously when they cancel and the reason for their cancellation. Um, so I always instruct people to get travel insurance and they can purchase that directly through me um, so that that ensures that they will indeed get their money back in the event that I cannot get their funds back. If that answers your question. Oh yeah, that's perfect. And is there anyone else that has any part of that? Oh, well, I, go ahead, Lorraine, sorry. I was gonna say that when, when I take deposits from people, I always take more than the supplier is expecting. So if it's a $150 deposit, I will take $250. One of the things that I think the pandemic has taught us is to document that differently. Certainly in Canada and certainly even more specific is in Ontario, where we are under the rules of the government of Ontario, um, which is called TICO. And we really do have to um, tell everybody everything that we're doing. And in the past, we would take 250 deposit. If they canceled, we keep the $100. Nobody, nobody questions where that's going. They just know that they're going to lose their deposit. Now we are going to call it a service fee. We're going to document it differently. And we're going to have to say to people, <coughs> this is a service fee. If you cancel and it's your choice, unfortunately, you will lose that, but it will look on your invoice that part of it is coming to me and part of it is going to the tour operator. You're only going to lose that if you choose to cancel, but it's just basically to protect me um, in the future, as you know, COVID, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and I think we've just got to also protect ourselves, take the deposits enough to cover yourself for any losses, because you have to look at time, you have to look at marketing materials that you've paid for, um, paid out for. And if they did, if they then choose to cancel, you know, it, it's something that you've got to um, value your own time and your own money that you've put into it. We're a little bit different here, different but the same, um, because our agency and, and the girls who work with me, uh, we charge professional services, or and when it's a group, we call it professional management service fees that we pay up front before we even do the deposits. And depending on the group, um, sometimes we do build in um, the same thing that Lorraine and Erica do, um, but like if it's a specialized themed cruise, like we have a talent out of Boston and a Frank Sinatra cruise um, in March on American Queen. You know, we we built that in certainly because we want to make sure it's our markup to cover for his cabin and all of other jazz. But, um, you know, we always charge for our services regardless upfront before we do any work. 
Yeah. Thank you so much for that. And a uh, final question to round us out. And I'm glad that someone asked this because I realized that we never got into this one is, um, well, B- Vicky asked, do you have a spreadsheet that helps you price a trip and pay for your compensation? But the bigger, broader question that I kind of wanted to ask is how do you keep everything organized to, to, for that, for payments and pricing, but just all of it, you know, and, and we don't have as much time here. So maybe we need more time for that type of question, but I'll just let, um, Eric, I'll, I'll let, I'll start with you here. How do you keep everything organized? And are you using like a spreadsheet to track that those expenses? Uh, yes, I, I call it my paper planes and passports Bible. Um, I have a, I have a sheet for every single group trip that I host. Um, if it is a group trip that I am managing and not hosting, they are also included in that Bible um, that it entails all of my expenses um, throughout the course of the year. So I literally have a roll up of all of my expenses from every single trip, all of them populate automatically. Um, I have the formulas in there. So it's less work that I have to do. I literally can copy and paste and just keep everything in one place. And I can go back and see where I'm uh, based off of the number, you know, what's my profit and or losses based on the number of people that I have traveling. So that is um, that's, that's my Bible. (laughs) I I would lose it without that. (laughs) Yeah. And Lorraine, how about for you? What, what helps keep you organized? Well, I'm old fashioned, you know, it's probably my age and I use the old fashioned sort of, you know, everything is printed (laughs) and everything is in here. And I'm sorry. I, I also do it on online as well. And I've used, you know, things like Travify and, 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 uh, different, programs (laughs) programs <laughs> and that sort of thing and that's great but I also will use the old-fashioned way because when it comes to final payments I will still be that person that spreads it all out on the bed and goes okay have they put how much they, you know because I like to be that but, but I'm in my late 50s I am sorry I'm old school and <laughs> just the way that it is it's the way I am love me or hate me it's the way I am but I'm going to be a bit controversial for a second can I do that with an answer yes to please that are coming in over the other side so a lot of people are asking for you know how do we find these low discounts how do we find um payment plans and who is giving the lowest deposit that we can offer to our clients um If those are your travel clients and you have to work that hard to get them to do payment plans and, 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 you know, they're, they're buying the cheapest possible trip that there is your 10% is not going to go very far. And it's going to take you the same amount of time to work on, as we say, I mean, you can't sell Cuba over there, but as we say, say it takes the same amount of time for us to sell a $300 trip to Cuba as it takes to sell a river cruise on the Danube. One commission comes with a 0.00, usually um, like a $15 commission and one's gonna have a comma. So maybe now is the time to look at who your client base is, what you're marketing, how you're marketing it, and get these people on a little bit higher priced trips. And if they want to do the, you know, $500 trip to the Bahamas or something like that, great. Here's the number for Expedia. On you go, you know? I'm Preach. sorry. That sounds great. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I have to, I kind of got to disagree with that one just okay. simply because, so for me, the goal for low income people that still want to travel the world. We don't want to limit to those people. We, I, for myself, want to offer an opportunity for those people to travel or for people that do not have a high credit card balance. What if they have a whole house or a wedding on on their credit card and they cannot afford to put anything else on their credit card or make a large sum payment or pay $15,000 for a vacation. That's not feasible for everyone. So having payment options does allow people to have a, you can still have a $15,000 vacation, but you can also have payment options so that you can spread those payments out so that 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 makes it more affordable and allows you to manage your money a little bit better. And why the, the rule is why spend all your capital up front if you don't have to, 
when you can put smaller amounts down and, and make payments over time. So and for me and my clientele, I have a, a wide range of uh, medium sized vacations and luxury type vacations. And my services can encompass everyone in between. And that's brilliant. And there are companies now that will allow that. So they'll um, they'll do these payment programs and things like that, I believe, that make it easier for certain people. I mean, for me, I, perhaps it's just I'm just old and menopausal. So I'm just <laughs> done with the whole, yeah, you want to go to Cuba? Yeah, knock yourself out. Bye-bye. <laughs> no, that's it. That's what I love that. That's why it's great, you know, to have all of those. And, and I apologize. We're about to go right at the time and get <laughs> shut it down. Like right We're when it's fun. I know. I know. Oh my gosh. That's how it always is. Yeah. The panel, it's always like right at the end. We're like, we could keep going. Let's keep going. <laughs> but no, this has been really good and I know really helpful. And I know there's so many questions out there too, um, that are still probably left unanswered and everything. So, um, feel free everyone. Um, after this, we will have the recording up, but, um, if there's anything that you didn't get ask or, or you have questions, um, email um, academy at travify.com and we can try to get you some answers. Um, but I just want to thank our panel again. This has been really great. And maybe we'll do this again in a year and the conversation will be pretty similar, but still very different, um, which is really cool. So it almost needs to be like an annual thing of uh, just group travel, you know, chats and how this is, um, how you can make it successful. But I just want to thank you all again, Lisa, Erica, Lorraine. Um, you guys have been amazing. We really thank appreciate you. your time. Yeah. And, and thank you everyone else too. And, um, enjoy the rest of your day weekend and travel. It is coming back and Lorraine, we're thinking of you in Canada and we hope that we get to see you soon. Um, but everyone else, thank you so much again and, um, have a great rest of your day and we'll see you on the next webinar. Thanks. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Thanks. See ya.